Thank you very much, and welcome to the first Australian conference in history ever to start with a Danish pop rock song. That's what I had them play there. Because we can, because we can. Um, I chose this song because of its energy, but also because of its simplicity. Um, it's two, verse, two verses and a chorus that just sort of repeats. It's like, you know, mid-90s pop rock, right? Um, and what it's called is, I Miss My Blue Blue Bicycle by this Danish band. And what they sing is this, I lost my blue blue bicycle, the one I had for eight years uh, since I was a boy, and now I'm never going to see it again. And um, it really says absolutely everything that we know and what we need to know about the role of the bicycle in, in our cities, the, the humble bicycle. A lot of people around the world miss their blue blue bicycles. A lot of cities around the world um, have lost them. So um, I really wanted to take this keynote in a lot of different directions, and there's a lot of different directions I could take it in, as maybe some of you know. Um, but I just, man, I just wanted to go back to that blue blue bicycle, back to the heart, the core, the root, the soul of the, of the truly life-size city. By now, many people in this room with an internet connection, as probably most of you have seen, photos like this on the internet, vintage photos of Copenhagen or Amsterdam, if you like. Beautiful photos, wide cycle tracks, critical mass of regular people on bicycles going to work in the morning. A photo like this uh, from Copenhagen, mid-1950s. Beautiful photos, you know, of, of what we imagine cities can be, perhaps, or, or, or used to be, depending who you are. Then you see photos like this of Copenhagen or Amsterdam now, today, as we speak. And uh, I just get the feeling that a lot of people say, oh, that's what, that's what those people did, and that's what those people do now. And that's probably just what they always did. You know, the Danes, you know, the Vikings up in Denmark, and you know, the hippies in the Netherlands, you know. And uh, even though it's so far from the truth, because there's a lot of photos on the internet nowadays, you know, more and more. There's a photo like this, kind of grainy, but it's a beautiful photo from the mid-1950s. These are office workers heading off on their lunch break. Is this Copenhagen? You know, it could be, but it's not. It's Canberra in the 1950s, man, back when cycling was normal in Australian cities. Another photo like this one, these are bicycles parked outside a cinema. Is this Utrecht? It could be, but it's not. It's up in Queensland, in northern Queensland, where, of course, it's far too hot for anybody ever to ride a bicycle, so let's not worry about that, right? You know, farther down the road from, uh, from, uh, uh, from there, Mackay, these are bicycles parked on the main street, you know, bicycles for transport in the mid-1950s. Photo like this from Melbourne, 1905, I think, 1910, I can't remember. You know, this is a church that organized a bike ride for regular citizens, encouraging them to use the bicycle as transport. This is nothing new. All this stuff we're going to be talking about this week, this is absolutely nothing new. Bi most cities in the world were bicycle-friendly for decades. Absolutely everything we need to rebuild and recreate our bicycle-friendly cities was invented at least 100 years ago, every single detail. This is your urban DNA. This is the urban DNA of virtually every city on the planet. You know, I have seen so many photos from Australian bicycle history. Bicycles built this nation, you know. They built every nation in the developed wor world, and they're building the developing nations today. It just doesn't stop. It's amazing. There's a lot of great international minds in this room, in this city this week, and listen to them, you know. Listen to them like we listen to each other every time we meet up at, at these Velo City conferences and stand on a stage with a hangover because you're drinking with the mayor of Copenhagen. Thanks so much for that. Uh, and the mayor of Adelaide. Sorry, you started it, actually. Yeah. Um, but I, I want to offer some, you know, I got the room. I have the floor. I want to offer some expert advice here while I have the opportunity because I've been talking about you, Adelaide. I've been discussing you with the world's youngest urbanist, the Lulu. The Lulu, six and a half years old. That's my daughter. And uh, it's, it's really funny. Ab absolutely everywhere I go in the world to do these talks and to work on our international projects with my company, people come up and say, hey, man, great talk. Thanks for coming. Love your work. How's the Lulu? Everybody loves the Lulu. You can check out our hashtag on Instagram and Twitter. Um, we just do our school run photos every day. I mean, Lulu's rocking it. But we were having breakfast last week, and, um, and I asked her out of the blue, which is the best way to approach things with the Lulu, you know, right out of the blue, catch her off guard. And uh, I said, hey, you know, in a minute we're going to ride our bikes to school like we do every day. But I'm going to this city called Adelaide, and it's in this country called Australia. She's six and a half, right? And, um, and I said, you know, if we, if we lived there, we probably couldn't ride our bikes to school. Okay, because you know, they don't have any cycle tracks and, and they haven't slowed down the cars, the speed limits for cars like other cities and stuff. So if we lived there, we'd probably have to drive a car or take a bus or a tram or something. What do you think about that? And she looks up without hesitating from her muesli and says, I feel sorry for them. I feel sorry for them. It was from, her, it was from the heart. It was the first thing out of her mouth. Down at the other end of the table is the Felix. He's 12. 
He's, uh, he's more in the loop. We have a lot of really great conversations about stuff like this. I brought him to Melbourne three years ago. I spoke at the State of Design uh, Festival there. So, you know, he's, he's, he's pretty in the loop. So, um, but now he's a preteen. He's 12. So he's got this prepubescent attitude thing going on, right? So he's sitting at the other end of the table listening to this. And he, he just sort of says, don't they have money? Okay? Like, why don't they just build it? Duh. He actually said, duh. That wasn't me. Uh, you know, he's just like, duh. Right? Um, then Lulu pipes up at the other end of the table, and you know, I mean, she doesn't really know where all these cities and countries are just yet, and she says, yeah, but Daddy, Daddy, that, that, that place you're going to, do they even have money there, or are they like Africa? <laughs> you know, like kind of poor, you know? It's a good question. You guys deal with that yourselves, right? Um, and I explained, well, there's a cycle track in this city that, I, that I've, I've heard about, you know, sort of a, uh, doesn't really connect with anything, but it's there, which is good. Maybe not best practice design, but it's there, it's good. But now there's people in the city who actually want to take it out. They're just starting, and they want to take out the cycle track. And Lulu looks at me kind of incredulously, and she says, she'd been thinking about this, she says, how do they go shopping if they don't have cycle tracks? This is like, you know, she was just sort of wandering. How does, you know, in the mind of a six-year-old Copenhagen kid, the logistics involved, in, of people in a city going shopping without cycle tracks and bicycles. I mean, who are these people? My God. Um, actually, I had two friends of mine in Australia. I wanted a comparative data here, so I said I, they have six-year-old kids, and I asked them to answer, ask the reverse question of these Australian kids. Imagine if we had to go to school now. We'd be doing on bicycles. We'd ride bicycles all day. And, uh, and uh, my Australian friends both reported back seeing the, the Australian kids who were six. They went, oh, cool, cool. You know, that was just the most amazing thing. You know, they didn't feel sorry for us, but they were just like, that is the kind of world I want to live in. But I want to talk about the role of the bicycle in the urban anthropology of, uh, of our cities, in, in, in the five senses in the life-size city. We, we do a lot of talking at these conferences and in our industry. We talk about engineering and planning and budgets and feasibility studies. You know, we geek out about the tech specs of one cycle track on one street in one city. We waste time talking to the ignorant who resist the modernization of our cities. We talk all these, all these different words we use, like scale and everything. It just means nothing to the 99%. And I just wanted to take the simpler route. I wanted to look at how the bicycle you know, can, can stimulate our five senses in the life-size city. So let's start with sight, right? Imagine transporting yourself in the life-size city. You're surrounded by humanity. You're surrounded by your fellow citizens all day long, on bicycles, on foot, on public transport. You're surrounded by human forms and full human forms all day long, bodies in motion, right? This is what we like. This is like total anthropology. This is what humans like to look at. The city of Strasbourg in, Fr in, in France, a very life-size city, a very bicycle-friendly city, they've taken this concept to their trams. These are their new trams. They're the coolest trams in the world. They have like windows that are incredibly ex you know, extended. So when you see a tram rolling past in the street, you see like a human being sitting there looking out at the city. The only thing you can't see is their shoes. They understand urban an anthropology in, uh, in Strasbourg. You know, you, you, you live in a city, there's a reason you do, you do so, you chose to live there, you want to look at it, right? You cross bridges and harbors in different cities around the world, and I've, I've studied this for years, you see people just invariably drawn to look out over the harbor, the water, the color of the water, the light on the buildings, the, the clouds, I don't know what they're looking at, I don't know what I look at, it's completely irrelevant. They're looking at their city, they're regarding it, and they've been given the opportunity to do so all day long. I see this every morning on my way to work through uh, the center of Copenhagen. In the age of smartphone technology, people check in the clock tower to see what time it is. And they do one of two things. They either speed up because they're late, or they, whew, they just see them slow down because they realize they're a little bit ahead of schedule. All day long in the life-size city, you see human beings sending signals to each other. You know, on a bike or as a pedestrian, you know, we're, all, we're, all, we're, we're always interacting. You know, and they're using their body to send these, these subtle secret messages between strangers on a, you know, turning, right, turning left, turning right, stopping and whatnot. In the life-size city, you should be able to take a photo like this of citizen cyclists and pedestrians all sort of moving in one direction and magically snap your fingers, make all the bicycles disappear, and you can't see any difference, right? You know, the posture's the same, the clothes are the same. This is really, for me, a sign of the life-size city. Thank you. Thank you. Sound, of course, let's, listen, let's talk about sound. Sound is incredibly important in cities. I mean, cities are often noisy places, but you're transporting yourself with your fellow citizens, you know, with, with, with humanity, and you hear human sounds. You hear people talking, you know, <clears throat> clearing their throat, all sorts of, all these sounds that humans make. We don't register it, but it's there somewhere inside of us. The girl on the right there, she's, uh, she's doing something that I notice is very normal in, in Danish and Dutch cities. She's actually shoulder, oh, I'm going back here, sorry. Where are we? There we are. She's actually shoulder checking. It's not a big demonstrative shoulder check that you have to do when you're, you're, you're mixing with cars, running with the bulls in Pamplona. She's actually, I've noticed that 
it's very, very subtle, very nuanced, uh, the way that people listen in the city. She's actually just doing a bit of a, 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 a cock of the head, peripheral vision, and she's listening. I've been really looking at this for years. People are just listening. We can, we're so attuned to riding with so many other people on bicycles that we can actually hear if bicycles are rolling up behind us. Parents coming home from school with their kids on bikes, on cargo bikes, talking. You know, how was your day? What are we having for dinner is always the question I get. It's like, how was your day? No, no, what are we having for dinner, Dad? All right. You know, but, but snippets of human conversation all day long. This is, the, this is the screenplay of the urban theater that is the life-size city. The sense of touch as well. You interact physically with your urban landscape when, when you live in a life-size city, leaning up against a light post, putting your foot on a garbage can uh, while you're waiting for the light to change. You know, you're using the urban landscape to push your bicycle into motion, touching the curb or the asphalt. I see this in a lot of cities now. I've, this is one photo from Paris, but I've seen this in a lot of cities with bike share. People just hanging out on the bike share bikes, right? <laughs> using them as urban furniture, just sort of hanging, because that space is cool to hang in. Damn, somebody made a seat for me. You know, there you go. I've seen this. I've seen it in New York. I've seen it in a lot of different cities. I love it, interacting physically. You see this all the time in the life-size city, of course. Uh, couples holding hands, uh, cycling with a hand on each other's shoulder while they're going off to the cinema or wherever, touching each other. Taste as well. Everything we can do in a city, we, we can do on a bicycle. We know that, nothing new. People snacking. This is Paris again, you know, having a sandwich between their A to B. You know, I drink my coffee on the last stretch on, on my way to work every morning. Tasting the weather, you know, uh, raindrops on your lip, you know, the, the, the ice, the wind, and the cold in, in, in the wintertime. The sense of smell, that most powerful of all of our senses. You smell the seasons in the life-size city, the wet leaves in the autumn, the blossoming flowers, the budding trees in the spring. You smell all the things the city has to offer, coffee shops, bakeries, especially bakeries, uh, restaurants and whatnot. You smell each other, which kind of sounds weird when you say it on a stage in front of a bunch of people, but you, know, you ride to work in the morning rush hour in Copenhagen, it's an olfactory sensation, all these perfumes and colognes and shampoos and whatnot in a crowd like that. Just on my way home from work last Friday, just last Friday, 28, uh, 28 degrees in Copenhagen, beautiful day. I'm heading home from work, and I got behind this, uh, this, this woman in front of me, and I, and I smelled, she had suntan lotion on. I'm going, bitch, I was working today, and she was at the beach, you know? But it was cool, because I thought, I could go to the beach, and I did, I rearranged the dinner, and I went out to the beach for a couple hours with my kids um, after dinner, wonderful. I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't smelled her, which again, sounds strange on a stage, but anyway. <clears throat> All these little urban anthropological details in cities are fascinating to me, and I love it, and I look at it all day long. I love seeing people yawn on bicycles. I have a whole series of photos of this. And, you know, for me, it really is uh, an indicator. If you don't see people yawning casually on bicycles in your city, you're doing something wrong. That simple. The bicycle is an urban magnifying glass. It takes these vast expanses of, of, of asphalt and concrete, and, and it just narrows them in so we can see the human details that we want to see in cities. I see people I know all, every day in my neighborhood. You're sort of waving across the street, they're cycling the other direction, you shout at them, hey, seven o'clock, right? Okay, yep, see you then. Um, you owe me money, yeah, or whatever it is. Stopping spontaneously to talk to a friend like these women do, you do it all the time. Something as simple as shopping, window shopping. You can't shop at 50 kilometers an hour in a car, you know? But you can in a life-size city, rolling past the shops, seeing what they have on offer, oops, stopping spontaneously to go into these different shops. The bicycle creates social and anthropological density like no other invention in human history. It's quite a fantastic thing for cities. For the better part of 100 years, we've been asking a lot of the same questions in cities, and uh, in particular in transport. The model at the bottom is the question that we've been asking of traffic engineers for about 100 years. Hey man, how many cars can we move down this street? You know, how, many, what's, how can we optimize flow and, and, and capacity? And, um, we know now that this is probably the stupidest question we've asked in 7,000 years of cities. The question at the top, this is the question for the 21st century city, the city that wants to be life-sized, the city wants to modernize. How many people can we move down this street? This is the new question. All the good practice around the world, cities are moving, cities are doing stuff, but you know, a lot of people still say, oh, it's a bit risky. You know, it's a risky business. Ooh, should we invest in bikes? You know, like the guy on stage said, you know, it's like one half of 1% of the transport budget, you know, and ooh, but it's still risky. I'm still not convinced. Oh, you think, God, man. If you're old like me, you might actually remember the film Risky Business with a young Tom Cruise in the role of Joel. It's this scene in the film where he receives valuable, life-changing advice from his friend, Miles. The fact that he's on a bike in the scene has just added value to my storytelling here. That's just cool karma. Um, 
Dramaturgically speaking, in filmmaking, this is the point of no return in this film, for the main character and for the plot of the film. And man, I feel it so often that we're at the point of no return in the way that we're looking at our cities, the way that we're planning for our cities. There's, I, I love my job. I think I have the best job in the world. I get to work with so many amazing cities and governments and, and, and do all these great projects. And I see what's happening in other cities, the cities that have gone from being zeros to heroes, you know, the cities where there are no bicycles left seven years ago, um, and now they're well on their way to becoming bicycle-friendly. Paris, Barcelona, Dublin, uh, Bordeaux, Budapest, Seville, Buenos Aires. My God, Buenos Aires. 140 kilometers of separated bicycle infrastructure in the last two years. They're rocking it. You're going to hear a lot more about them. But then you see all these cities, it just makes the cities that, that are content with baby steps, it just makes them kind of look a bit silly, you know? Um, and, and it frustrates me sometimes, um, all these baby steps. So here, in this scene, in this film, a very important film for me when I was young as well, Miles says to his best friend, Joel, he says, Joel, sometimes you just have to say, what the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck? What the fuck gives you freedom, he says. Freedom brings opportunity. Opportunity makes your future. If you can't say it, you can't do it. That's what he says to Joel. So basically, I want all of us to say this together. I want to kick off Velo City because, you know, if there is a generation in desperate need of being able to say, what the fuck, it's this generation right now, especially regarding livable cities and transport in cities. The entire generation couldn't be here today with us unfortunately, um, but the people in this room are worthy representatives, and you're going to be their voice, and we're all going to say this now, and we're going to do it on three. One, two, three, what? <laughs> yeah, cool. But seriously, that wasn't good enough. Our, c <laughs> Our cities are broken, people. We have urbanization. We have you know, people dying still in our cities. Our children are unhealthy. We have the most powerful tool in our urban toolboxes to rebuild livable cities, bicycle-friendly cities. It's been there for 125 years, ready to serve, as it always has been. So I want to say it one more time. Now I want you to say it. So I've said it, I say that all the time. But uh, on three, and this time you mean it. One, two, three. What? What the fuck? Now we said it. Now we do it, and let's start now. Thank you. <laughs>